Hi, I'm Rakesh Kurana. I am the Danoff Dean of Harvard College and really excited to welcome our family, our guardians, our extended Harvard family uh, to our discussion today, which is on the liberal arts and sciences uh, at Harvard College. So uh, with me are two wonderful guests, uh, our Dean of Undergraduate Education, Amanda Claybaugh, and our wonderful colleague from our history department, uh, Professor Maya Jasanoff. Welcome, both of you. It's so great that you're here. Um, we're really excited uh, for uh, this event today. It's an opportunity for us to uh, delve into sort of the core of what we do as an institution, which is our teaching, um, and what it means to be Harvard College within a larger research university, uh, to talk a little bit about the mission, and uh, a lot of exciting things that are happening. We've also had an opportunity to get many questions from all of you, so we'll be weaving that through our discussion today. Uh, and uh, we got a lot, so we're probably not going to get through all of them, but we really tried to sort of find the ones that sort of, uh, where there was a lot of overlap, where people had some similar questions. But uh, for those of you who have had an opportunity to tune in before, uh, I always start with the mission of the college. Uh, for those of you who this is the first time, um, I hope uh, this will give you a sense of the frame that we use uh, as we think about the college and its activities. So the mission of Harvard College has been for almost four centuries now to educate the citizens and citizen leaders for our society. It's a mission our college takes quite seriously. We helped educate some of the people who imagine this nation and its aspirations. Our students, our faculty, our staff, or some of the people who helped lead the anti-slavery and abolition movements. Um, other than the two oldest military academies, no institution has given more lives in service of its nation than the college. And other than the two oldest military academies, no institution has more people awarded the Medal of Honor than the college. And this notion of service and service leadership runs through so many dimensions of our collective political, social, economic, civic life, civil rights, equality of marriage. Uh, in all of these areas, intellectual leadership, you'll find members of our community uh, seeking to help us understand where we are, where we've come from, uh, to advance justice and fairness in the world, to help heal the world. Um, and like our own nation, there's an incredible history that we're proud of. Uh, and like our own society, but we also recognize that there are moments uh, in our past where we weren't as inclusive as we could have been and still could be. So our aspirations run ahead of our reality. But we do this through our belief in the transformative power of a liberal arts and sciences education. It begins for us with the intellectual transformation. New ways of knowing, new ways of understanding, all toward the goal of developing an independent mind. Helping our students gain an appreciation for the role of reason and evidence. Learning how to disagree without being disagreeable. And then we embed that in a very diverse living and learning experience where students study alongside students who are different from them, who are studying different subjects, come from different walks of life, have different identities, evolving identities, which we believe not only deepens that intellectual transformation, but sets the conditions for a social transformation, our understanding of what it means to be part of this community. That a community is more than just a collection of interests and dialogue is more than the exchange of claims and counterclaims, where students learn to see behind each other's eyes and to hear from another's perspective. And through those experiences, we hope our students begin to answer some questions for themselves. Who am I and who do I want to be? How do I relate to others and what can I learn from others? What are my gifts and talents and how can I best use them to serve the world? So a personal transformation. Um, these things all go to the heart of our liberal arts and sciences experience. And I can't think of two better people uh, to help us talk about uh, what we're trying to do at Harvard College, uh, both in your experiences as Amanda, as the leader and responsible for the undergraduate experience and the classroom experience. And Maya, you know, you've played so many leadership roles um, throughout the college in so many different ways. Uh, but also, most importantly, as one of the most celebrated faculty members we have, um, at the college and uh, as, as, as a leading historian, in, in not only in your field, but really, I think, one of Harvard's shiniest lights. So um, it's wonderful to have you here. So when we think about liberal arts and sciences, um, you know, there's a lot of different definitions, and maybe even you know, different people see different aspects of a liberal arts and sciences education. Um, we've been at the college over the last few years really looking at our liberal arts and sciences uh, uh, values, our liberal arts and sciences mission, and as we periodically do, renewing that. Um, and Amanda, you've had an opportunity uh, as now almost getting to one year as dean of undergraduate education uh, to both help lead, to move things forward, to 
uh, uh, you know, uh, introduce new things around liberal arts and sciences, especially in, you know, work that we're doing around our Harvard College curriculum. And I was wondering if you could just share a little bit about what's exciting for you, uh, what are we learning, what, what are things that are coming up? Yeah. So the Harvard College curriculum, um, as you know, all students have picked concentrations while they're here. And then they um, fulfill requirements having to do with those concentrations. But all students also share a set of requirements, expectations, in common, and that's what we're calling the Harvard College curriculum. And it comes in three parts. Um, there's a set of courses that aim to ensure that students learn fundamental capacities. So students think of it as writing, uh, math, and um, foreign language. You could also think of it, and this is how we're encouraging them to think of it, as learning how to make arguments with words, learning how to make arguments with data, and learning um, basically about uh, intercultural contact and the kind of work of translating across cultural divides. So that's sort of a set of capacities that we think are absolutely fundamental to any kind of intellectual work, but also um, any work that students are going to want to do after Harvard. And then there's a second set of uh, requirements that are the distributional requirements. And so students take one course in arts and humanities, one course in social sciences, one course in natural sciences or applied sciences. And the goal here is to have students understand that in the university, we organize knowledge by disciplines. Um, and each discipline looks at certain objects, um, applies certain methods, asks certain kinds of questions has certain strengths, has certain limitations. And we want students to have a sense of what it means to approach questions from different disciplinary perspectives. So those two things, the kind of fundamental capacities and the distributional requirements, are typical of all liberal arts schools. I think most of our peers do the same thing. I think what's unique about Harvard is the third aspect, which is the kind of cap, uh, cornerstone of our curriculum, which is the general education program. Um, and Gen Ed is a place, there's a lot of ways to describe it, but one way is to think about it as the liberal arts in action. Um, these courses are centered on uh, an urgent current problem like climate change or inequality, or they focus on an enduring question, something humans have thought about for centuries, something like creativity or consciousness or loss. And it, those courses recognize that you know, the university divides knowledge into disciplines, but life is not like that. <laughs> and so if you're going to think about these questions or think about these um, topics, you need to do so from multiple disciplinary perspectives. Um, and so these courses bring our, you know, I think, really our most inspiring faculty to take on the kind of questions that really matter. Um, and our hope, and we've been renewing the program this year to launch again in the fall, and our hope is to make it, you know, the program where it's the kind of courses faculty have always dreamed of teaching and the kind of courses students never forget. Um, and actually, one of these courses is, is taught by Maya. Oh, Maya. <laughs> Fancy that. Yeah, <laughs> it's really great. Well, so, you know, I, I think, I mean, that's really helpful because I think it, you know, that kind of Harvard College curriculum kind of points to this kind of breadth um, as well as gen ed in, in those areas. And Maya, you, you know, as a member of a disciplinary department, history, but also somebody who's participated in teaching kind of gen ed programs and actually part of the gen ed review committee even, I think, uh, if I remember correctly, um, you know, how do you describe both the depth and the breadth aspects as a faculty member, as the types of courses that you're teaching, how that ties into kind of your sense of the liberal arts? I think. The answer probably comes from even my sense of what my discipline is to begin with. I am a historian, and there are, of course, you know, professional conventions and codes and skills and practices that we acquire in the in the training as a graduate student and beyond that make us good historians. At the same time, history is something that everybody has, everybody <laughs> participates in. Yeah. Uh, we're all experiencing and shaping, and so you know, it's a discipline that's not a discipline because it's also uh, a feature of our. Uh, every one of our uh, experiences and inheritances. And so typically when I approach the teaching of history, uh, I say to students, look, you know, history is the study of being in time. Mm -hmm. History is about how we move through time. And so I can give you a variety of tools with which to think about how to move through time. Now, in some of my history classes, I'm very interested in looking at the specific trajectories and lineages that led to the creation of, for example, the borders of uh, post-colonial nation states, or that led to some of the conflicts that shaped uh, the 20th century, or that led to uh, the, uh, the, the development and ultimately the dismantling of institutions like, say, 
slavery, right? So sometimes I'm interested in those, what I would consider to be sort of content-based uh, issues. Uh, but I'm equally interested, often, in showing students how to approach these kinds of questions about how to be in time, about how things change over time, about how the contexts in which we operate can direct our actions in ways that we are more or less aware of. Uh, and I try to do that in, in other ways. So for example, the gen ed class that I'm teaching now takes on what I believe to be really kind of the, maybe the, the fundamental way that many of us first encounter the sense of being in time, um, which is uh, the idea of ancestry, that all of us come from somewhere. Um, and many of us care quite a lot about where we come from, uh, albeit for a whole range of different reasons. And we all have quite different relationships, I think, to, to where we come from. But I thought, you know, this is, this is where the, the, the concept really comes to life for so many of our students. And so the, the course that I've developed is, uh, it's called Ancestry, Where Do We Come From and Why Do We Care? Mm -hmm. uh, and the course basically shows us how this concept has uh, been deployed and um, developed uh, over millennia across different societies around the world from the origins of Homo sapiens up to the DNA tests, which are uh, so popular uh, and so widespread in the media today. That's great. Um, can I ask a follow-on question, sure. if you don't mind? So, like, you know, your ancestry course, um, obviously, and connecting it to, as you said, history, you know, which brings us across time and space. Um, you know, one of the questions that we've gotten um, uh, from uh, families is, you know, uh, being able to discuss difficult topics or topics that might challenge our sense of identity, mm -hmm. our values that kind of taken for grantedness that, you know, I think all of us walk around with. Um, there's concern sometimes that that sort of give and take and that kind of willingness to kind of interrogate or explore those areas is difficult, uh, given the diversity of perspectives and points of view. And yet we know that's so essential to mm -hmm. our education. In your classes, in your experience, how do you set the conditions for that kind of dialogue to happen? Where do you find success? Where are there challenges? How should we think through that as not only an institution, you know, where this is essential to the creation of knowledge and the transmission of knowledge and understanding ourselves, but also for society that needs to be able to speak across and listen with the same intensity that it wants to be heard? So I think the first thing I would say is that a lot of the time people uh, shy away from difficulty. Um, they do that in a whole variety of venues, but I think that when it comes to the sorts of um, things you're talking about, difficult, controversial topics, people feel a discomfort which can either be the result of being uncertain about their own position and whether their own position will be recognized by those around them, or can be the product of hearing things from others that make them feel challenged in their own um, you know, belonging or sense of comfort in, uh, in, a, in a given situation. And so the impulse, I think, a lot of the time now uh, is for people to say, well, I'm uncomfortable and that's difficult and so it's better if we just don't talk about it. And I would say that that's exactly the opposite of what an education should be about. And I think that the first step is to say that the classroom is the place where you do discuss difficult ideas because it is a structured environment in which to do so. Uh, and I have found, interestingly, over recent years that it's actually been something that people are more sensitive to and about, but also maybe more reluctant to engage in. Mm. And I wouldn't be surprised if the media the social media environment that we're operating in has something to do with it. Um, so I think it's important now, in a way that I didn't feel perhaps a decade ago, to foreground class discussion by saying, mm. look, education is about dialogue over difficult things. And you may feel uncomfortable, but I want you to explain that discomfort or to use it to animate your position in this discussion. Obviously, it always has to be coupled, in my opinion, with another major plank of, I think, what we're trying to do in the college and hopefully in American society as a whole, which is to say, look, we're a diverse society. We are made up of people with very different life experiences and, and positions on things. And the whole point, in a way, of bringing people together is that they educate each other. And what that means, though, 
is that you can't assume that people are going to have thought through issues in the same way and from the same vantage points as you have. You can't assume they're going to already be at the point that you've arrived at. Mm -hmm. And so it requires a degree of patience sometimes, which people can be uncomfortable about delivering. Mm -hmm. And it can also require a degree of self-consciousness, which for other people can sometimes be a little difficult. And I hope that students will leave this college much better able to deal with those things and engage in, in difficult conversations. I really appreciate that because I think, you know, as you said, this goes right to the heart of what education does, right? It, it, it causes us to pause, interrogate, approach things critically, not only about other things, but also about ourselves. And it also, I think, connects to the mission of what I often think about citizenship and citizen leadership, which is being a leader is learning to be comfortable with being uncomfortable, um, being able to sort of be comfortable with change, to be able to be the person who speaks out when maybe others are sort of conforming, when they see something it's challenging. And if you can't do that in a classroom, the challenges of doing that out there where the world can even feel more fraught is lower. So I, I really appreciate you sort of uh, creating those conditions for our students. Amanda, any thoughts on that? Well, I have, I have two. Actually, when you were saying that, you said in, in the classroom so as to prepare for the world. But I, I do just want to say on behalf of our students that it strikes me that Harvard is a much more diverse place on all axes than almost any other domain. Mm -hmm. And so in life after college, people tend to self-segregate, right? They live alongside people of similar lifestyles. They are friends with people who share their political views. Um, and what we're doing here is really challenging. Um, we are bringing together people from multiple, multiple perspectives and asking them to find a way yeah. to hear each other. And so I, I say this just because sometimes in the newspaper I see descriptions of students being a little snowflakey or a little yeah. quick to shut things down. And I, that's just not my experience of our students. And, um, and I would say that if sometimes there are a little bit of rough spots when they're trying to figure out how to have these kinds of conversations, they're trying to do a very challenging thing. I really appreciate what you're saying. I, I, I also live with the students as faculty dean yeah. at Cabot, and I have yet to meet one of these overly sensitive students, actually, to be honest. What I often meet are students who are deeply engaged, who are asking questions, who haven't come from environments. You know, while many of us may have had experiences being my, a minority, given the way our society is organized, many of us have not really lived in a truly diverse environment or, or uh, you know, um, work in those kinds of areas. So we are developing these new capacities and skills, and, 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 and I think students don't have actually candidly right now a lot of good role models out in the world to point to as examples of people having these conversations. And so a lot of that responsibility comes to them at a very, you know, at, at, at a very important time, um, but also, as you said, at a time of great change with technology and all of these things that sort of amplify and, and uh, um, uh, a lot of our sort of uncertainties. And I think I think we're really fortunate to be at a place where we're trying to be at the vanguard of developing these capacities and those skills um, here. So one of the areas that you know we often talk about um, is that we, we've been developing sort of new pedagogies and new concentrations mm -hmm. um, in the last few years. There's a, a, few, a couple of new concentrations that have just showed up in the, in the last few years. Uh, I'd love to hear about that, new tracks that are um, happening in departments um, and how, you know, uh, especially for first year uh, uh, students uh, and families, what are some of those new things that are happening that are different than the five or six subjects that many of us had offered in high school? Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, that's one of the um, major things I would like uh, students to understand about first year, which is that you go from a you know a high school where you had maybe 10 subjects to a place where there are 50. Um, and I would really like students to take shopping period, for instance, as an opportunity. Students talk a lot about um, the kind of intellectual exploration that shopping period um, allows. And I would encourage them to really do that intellectual exploration across disciplines um, mm -hmm. and to think, you know, I'm interested in a topic. Uh, students often think if I'm interested in power, I have to study government. But actually, many disciplines study power and they do them in different ways. Um, new concentrations, so the, I think the most recent one is theater, dance, and media. Um, and that is aligned with um, a general trend I see among our undergrads, which is more and more students being interested in making things. Um, and so there's renewed or stronger interest in um, creative writing and various kinds of arts practices, as well as theater, dance, and media. And so that's a real growth mm -hmm. opportunity. Yeah. Um, the other uh, new track that I actually had a, a role in um, helping with was um, a track in uh, ethnic, I forget what we call it, ethnic studies, ethnicity, migration, something like this, in um, 
in the program in history and literature, which I used to chair. And so that gives students um, an opportunity to concentrate now in a topic that is of great interest to many of them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I think it's a really important thing because I think it speaks that we're also trying to always identify new areas of yes. knowledge, uh, you know, that are, you know, uh, uh, curriculum um, and majors are dynamic. They're not static. I mean, I think if we would have been having this conversation in the late 19th century, uh, obviously it wouldn't be on YouTube, yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, but there would have been four or five subjects at Harvard, yeah. right? Uh, uh, it was like philosophy, math, Greek, Latin, uh, Hebrew, and that would have constituted a liberal arts and sciences education. It would have looked different in the early part of the 20th century. So I think that's really exciting. Yeah. I think also um, environmental sciences is another right. new concentration that's coming on board this fall. Uh, or, and and you know uh, uh, in a way that has an incredible amount of interest among our students that both has strong roots in the liberal arts and sciences very much like along the lines you said um, both of you said this is an area that doesn't fit neatly into a single discipline it's transdisciplinary it involves obviously important science but it involves policy economics uh, culture all of the history all of these things are part of really understanding this very important real phenomena um, in, in the world. Um, when you think about some of the new pedagogies, Maya, I know you've been some of the, an innovator in some of, you know, thinking about different pedagogies in history, doing different methods, bringing them from other schools, um, case method and stuff. H how has that sort of affected your teaching and how you identify things? Obviously, lectures are really important and they will continue to be, but how else are you thinking about these other approaches that you know we have possibilities of undertaking now that we didn't have before? So I think that uh, the goal for me in teaching is to engage my students and make them think. And the lecture can sometimes be very effective at that because if you are giving a history lecture of the kinds I give, which tend to focus on events and individuals and so on, you can tell them like a story and illustrate them and keep people's interest and, uh, and make them think that way. But another really great way to do it is to make them think through the issues as you're explaining it. And so that's where I was very um, informed by the business school case method uh, in a course that I developed a few years ago um, with a colleague who's now left in which we took some uh, historical episodes and we asked students to do a lot of reading in advance about those historical episodes and then we led the entire class as a basically Socratic dialogue in which the two of us would present our views about things mm -hmm. and essentially model the fact that you could have productive disagreements yeah, about yeah. things. Um, and then we would solicit different kinds of answers and contributions from the students. And so it was a real challenge for me, I have to say. I think, uh, you know, I was trained to be able to give lectures. Well, I have to say I wasn't entirely trained <laughs> to do it. Because of course, We're doing a better we job now. Yes, <laughs> yes, I mean, of it, doing it, that in it, grad school. Right. But, but, you know, the, the idea of the Socratic teaching method or something, case studies, this was not a part of anything that I was familiar with. And to be completely candid, I'm not as good at it as I am at giving a lecture. Um, and so some of it has to do with, again, living with discomfort and realizing that this can actually be a productive yeah. thing. And the result is that I've actually learned, therefore, to be less um, kind of concerned if I don't know the answer immediately or less concerned if students are disputing with each other or less concerned if I have to rephrase the question. In other words, I think that despite the fact that I'm not, I didn't hit the ground running as like a first class business school style <laughs> teacher, it made me a better teacher because it has made me better able to sort of listen and engage and move with the mood of the room and that sort of thing. So that's just one example. I could give many others, but you know, I think it's, it's one that our students are also very ready for and very eager to engage in and um, a great way to, you know, sort of take what's great about traditional methods. You can do a bit of presentation, a bit of lecturing, and then and then really bring them into yeah. the process. I, I really appreciate that. I think, you know, on multiple dimensions. One is that, you know, we're constantly looking for new ways and new understandings. But also, I think, to see a faculty, I, I could put myself in the, mm -hmm. uh, in the seat of a student, to see a faculty member continually kind of engaged in growth and learning, modeling vulnerability, um, this is not an air, this is something new for me. Um, I think it really inspires the students to also think about exploring, taking risks, and seeing like growth as 
as something that happens over a lifetime and, and a career. I think it's just fabulous that you do that. Um, and I guess one question that sort of maybe connects with is, you know, one of the things, you know, going back to them, we want our students to explore, and yet, you know, there are a lot of real pressures that um, I think people, f uh, you know, at least perceive, but also I think have, have some concreteness around uh, one question, for example, is, uh, how do we think about, is it difficult for students in the humanities and social studies to find internships? Um, how do we think about their summer opportunities? How do you motivate students to keep their interests um, and yet also be practical or, you know, what does practical mean in the Harvard College curriculum? You know, it is a Harvard degree, right. uh, which I think, you know, has, in, 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 you know, uh, uh, you know, it says something about the person as a hard worker and uh, obviously motivated individual. How do you think about that? Well, so. I the thing I constantly remind myself of is something that the director of our career services office, Robin Mount, likes to say, which is all, none of our degrees, none of our concentrations prepare you for a job. All of our concentrations prepare you for a job. And, and what she means by that is, um, you know, we're a liberal arts college. Um, we don't offer the kind of concrete, targeted, pre-professional preparation that gets you ready for a job at 22 um, and that helps you with that first step. What we provide you with are all of the skills and capacities that will enable you to have a productive career for 50 years. And the benefits of that, I think, are clear, um, because everything, all predictions about the future of work suggest that it's impossible to make predictions, right? Um, that we don't know what the world of work is going to look like in even 15 years. Right. Um, and so trying to kind of target a particular job and get some particular skills is not the way to go. The other thing we know, um, and, and what Career Services tells us is every time they talk to an employer, what they want to hear, what they're looking for, are the skills that one book calls robot-proof, right? Book Skills that cannot be automated away, the humanistic skills of, um, you know, decision-making, cultural competence, communication, empathy, all of these kinds of, of skills are the ones that employers are really looking for. So overall, in the big picture, I think we do a fantastic job of preparing students um, for work. It's still hard not to know what you're going to do at 22. Mm -hmm. um, and I think what makes it particularly challenging for students here is that there is, there's one set of paths that seems very obvious, right? So the path where you do finance, you do consulting, that all happens very early, that happens in a very structured way, that happens with those employers coming to campus. And so students who don't participate in that path tend to wonder if there's any support for anything else. And there absolutely is. But it looks different because those jobs are what career services calls just in time jobs. You know, they hire one at a time at um, you know at the last minute. You get those jobs through a much more sophisticated networking campaign that um, career services is absolutely there to help you with. Um, so I would say to students that if they're worried because their roommate knows for sure what he or she is going to do and the student hasn't figured it out, students should just go to career services. And mm -hmm. career services will help them um, and will coach them through the process no matter what the outcome is. To the concrete question about internships, we have uh, 200 public service internships um, through uh, the international, uh, the IOP, and we have 75 more public service inter internships through Mindich. We are fine with summer internships, and students who are worried about it should go to career services and find out about them. Yeah, no, I, I appreciate it. And I think also, you know, some of the other things that I think I'm also really proud of that I know that your office helps lead. Uh, what's unique about our Office of Career Services is actually reports to the Dean of Undergraduate Education, mm -hmm. so it's really connected to the academic mission. I think it keeps us in touch with what are the things that graduate schools are looking for, medical yes. schools, employers, yes. and so figuring, and, and this, so there's a conversation and dialogue that's always going on, uh, you know, within the academic mission, I think, yes. you know, with our life sciences groups and stuff. Um, there's also things that you also run out of your office, like, you know, research programs for the summer, uh, fellowships, uh, which are also things that are not always obvious to students that these are pathways. How, 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 what are some of those things that, that you would share about that? I would, I would say two things. I would say I would encourage um, students to remember, as you said at the beginning, that we are a liberal arts college in a research university. And so when we think about ourselves as a liberal arts college, we think about uh, that are that what we do is we create citizens and citizen leaders who will go out and do good in the world but a research university also produces knowledge mm -hmm. and that in itself is a social good right so just the research that's being done here right now is good for the world and I think it's students should 
make use of the opportunity to participate in that and to, and to be part of that. I would like every student to leave here feeling that whether through a senior thesis or a research summer or a capstone project or a research seminar, that they in some way contributed to knowledge. So, you know, the, the, the short answer is um, you should uh, contact the Undergraduate Research and Fellowships <laughs> Office who runs a whole um, uh, summer program for students to do research. Yeah, I think it's really important. And you know, I know I can imagine as an undergraduate, it's kind of scary to think outside of those things. And I, I would just sort of say, you know, it's important, as you said, being comfortable with being uncomfortable, to encourage. Uh, you know, if you are a family member or a friend of our students who's listening, you know, to sort of give students. Don't tell them what to do, but give them the confidence to, mm -hmm. to do that. I think that, that really matters a lot. I know for me, as uh, when I was uh, in college, you know, I came from an immigrant family. My parents told me, well meaningly, that there were like kind of four jobs that they knew of, like doctor, engineer, accountant, and then like, I don't know, it was kind of like <laughs> uh, something wild card out there. And, and I know it's really like scary sometimes because, you know, if, you, if, if you're trying to navigate the world to figure out all of those things, and there's some paths that are really well paved, and other ones where you you have to do more exploration. And I think on the flip side, also of that, as a as a as a as a young person, I really cared a lot about what my parents. They're, they've always been an inspiration to me, you know. And 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 you know, this it's so interesting about like as a parent now of two college students, really meaning well, and also recognizing sometimes I might send a message of expectations that I don't intend to send, mm. and how to like kind of telegraph that caring. And that knowing that our kids are going to be fine, and at the same time, pausing without giving too much advice—it's a really hard, it's a hard balance. Um, so when you think about, you know, if you could go back to your younger self, what advice would you have liked to have heard? I mean, my, you went to the college uh, as an undergraduate here. Um, what's different? What's changed around these pressures? Um, how did you find your path? I mean, I think that that my answer would actually build a bit off of what Amanda just said, in the sense that. Uh, I was struck when you were describing the the path of the the student, you know, the student whose roommate is going through all the steps <laughs> yeah. to get a job in a in a very well trodden area. That uh, you know, our students are are partly selected because they are very goal oriented people, and I think being goal oriented is uh, is a good thing in terms of you know how to achieve you know what you want in in life. I think it's a good thing, uh, and and I think we're right to reward it in certain ways. At the same time, uh, you have to learn to set your own goals. Mm -hmm. And I think that one of the challenges that students face here, that I faced a version of, uh, but I think has amplified, if mm -hmm. I may say, over recent years, is that there's been a kind of creep of postgraduate thinking into the college years backwards. So hmm. that by now, already in freshman year, people are kind of thinking, okay, what do I have to do in the coming summer? What am I going to do after sophomore year, et cetera, et cetera? And it makes those people who don't have a very obvious sense of what their goal is feel very uneasy. So to which I would say that, you know, this comes back to the whole purpose of the liberal arts. Mm -hmm. And in a way, the, the, the particular value of the humanities at this historical moment, mm. which is that learning how to be in time, learning how to <laughs> deal with the fact that you don't know what the future is going to hold, learning how to deal with the fact that y the goals are not always going to be given to you in the way that, say, getting into Harvard is a goal that is kind of culturally provided for you, uh, and learning how to deal with the fact that you may not know what the challenges you're going to face in the future are or what the ingredients of what your own happiness may be are. Uh, that is all the stuff, I think, of getting older mm. uh, and being yeah. in college. And I would say I lacked a lot of that stuff. <laughs> um, and for me, um, you know, I do think that I was to an extent goal oriented, but in an uneasy kind of way. That is to say, I knew, I knew what I liked which was reading and writing and being around certain kinds of people and traveling. I knew all of that. I had no doubts about that. But I didn't know how those ingredients would sort of fit into a professional package other than the one that I saw modeled in my parents, that I saw uh, obvious opportunities available to pursue in the form of fellowships and graduate school and so on. And so, you know, it worked out because I knew what I liked. And I think that's a really important starting point right. for anyone. Yeah. What do you like? Um, and then how do you deal with the fact that you 
you know, you, you don't have all the information about right. the future. You know, right. so so what I would say is just to every student um, and to their parents and guardians and family members, you know, we don't know what the unknown unknowns are, right? right. right. Like we know some things, like you have to do something after you graduate. Right. right. We know that. But we don't know a lot of the other things. And so again, it comes back to that question of being comfortable with living with that. Acquiring skills that make you feel better about living in those situations. Mm -hmm. uh, and acquiring a greater uh, confidence in, uh, in sort of who you are and what you like. And so I guess I would should just shift you know, the discussion from goals to purpose. Like right. who are you, what is your purpose, as opposed to what is the goal you're trying right. to hit. Right. Oh, that's, you know, it would be really interesting, like, rather than declaring a major or a concentration, we declared our purpose or a mission. Yeah, uh, you know, exactly. that, to, you know, I want to help in this area, or these are the things that really right. engage me. I think that's a really, um, you know, a wonderful way to, to, to think through those type of things. I also have to say, I love the humility of historians which is you don't try to predict the future. I think there's so many, I mean, I come from a world, I'm a business school faculty member, that we're always trying to predict the future when I think having historical perspective, as you just <laughs> sort of said, is the only thing you could predict about the future is that it's really hard to predict <laughs> and it's better to think about how would you navigate change, how do you yeah. adapt to change, uh, what are the capacities and humility of being a lifelong learner, learning to learn. Um, and how do we build that as a kind of essential capacity? I think it's hard, you know, just, you know, again, getting to selective schools from a high school level, you know, their, their students feel, you know, well, that's worked. Um, and the question is, but where you want to go next, just hitting rewind and play again from high school will probably not get you those types of capacities. You've already developed some of the ones that are about these, like, paths, goal-oriented, but there's a whole set of other ones um, and I think that's part of what we're trying to uh, do. Um, I mean, one of the things that, you know, um, we had a question about, like, uh, uh, for example, you know, sort of backtracking a little bit about um, creating new concentrations. And in one area we were touching base on was, you know, uh, a lot of interest uh, as a, and, and an area that students have identified, I think alumni, even faculty are having discussions around the area of ethnic studies and Harvard does not have a concentration in this area. What's the opportunities that people who have an interest in those areas have to sort of further explore that? And then maybe I'll just sort of share a little bit about like, you know, the difference between concentration and how departments get created. Right. So I think the, the first thing that has to just be said is that I think uh, the value of studying ethnicity is clear. Um, it's an area of study with a long and distinguished disciplinary history. It's also a topic of, you know, in obvious uh, interest today. Um, so I think the second question then is how best to institutionalize an area of study? And there's various ways to make this available, right? So one thing that I was able to do this year was to recruit faculty who are teaching ethnic studies courses to offer those courses in gen ed. Fabulous. So now students can fulfill their aesthetics and culture requirement by taking a course in um, global um, Asian popular culture focused around anime. They can take their course in history of societies and individuals with a course that focuses on the history of the Mexican border. Civics and ethics, a course taught by the philosopher Tommy Shelby on race and justice, and so on. Um, and so this is a way of bringing the question of ethnicity, making it front and center for all of our students, even the ones who don't know that they're, they're interested in it yet, and giving them all the opportunity to um, engage with these topics through Gen Ed. So that's sort of one way. Another way we talked about was uh, creating the track so that students can concentrate with a focus in ethnic studies and Histon Lit. There's also the secondary field in ethnicity, migration, and rights um, that students can add on to a concentration. Um, and then there's the question of whether it makes sense to have a freestanding department. Um, and that's a complicated question. There's intellectual aspects to that, um, whether it makes sense to put all faculty who are interested in an interdisciplinary topic into an interdisciplinary department, or whether it makes more sense to have those faculty fanned out across the disciplines. Um, what are the consequences of doing um, either one? And then there's the logistical um, questions of making a department, which you might want to talk about, Rakesh. Well, I, you, know, uh, you know, I think one of the things, I think it's an important question, and I, I, I know as, you know, creating new departments, means taking on a, a set of responsibilities as an institution also for the careers of people that you want to make sure as you build a department that you're able to 
uh, uh, you know, ensure all of the sort of uh, scaffolding that you need to make sure that happens. Uh, because I, I think there's a great response, intellectual responsibility, but also a human and moral responsibility. And I think letting that the faculty drive that becomes for me a really important part. Because without faculty ownership on that, um, it's it's hard to have the kind of follow through uh, at the quality level that we would want uh, and the critical mass, uh, so that people you know feel like this is a vital part of. Uh, the institution just like any other places. And I think it's it's an important set of issues that I know many institutions are struggling uh, with, but there are also models that we can learn from with other institutions. So uh, I think this is a topic that's alive and well, um, and um, I think it's an important one that we have to keep, in, we have to engage with in, in, in dialogue. Um, we've got a few other questions that are just coming over the transcript. I know we only have a few minutes left, so I want to make sure that we address so this one is a little bit outside of the liberal arts and sciences uh, 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 realm. It says, does the school know that there's a clear preference of rivers, uh, I guess uh, the river houses over quad houses among the students, uh, is there a solution to consider students' opinions in the process? So, um, so first of all, as a faculty dean, so I'm putting on my uh, faculty dean house uh, hat on, uh, I'm in one of the quad houses, which is Cabot, um, and, um, but I also am dean of the college, so I also understand, you know, and we have 12 outstanding opportunities and houses. And in fact, we have a 13th house, which is called Dudley as well, and I want to just um, uh, for students who are part of the Dudley community um, as well. So one of the things that I would say here is that we, we know that at Harvard, especially when you're in the first year, uh, we offer making all sorts of distinctions uh, among things. I think uh, when you're in a new place, you're always trying to sort of just grapple with the social geography of the place. and. And 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 I, I think there are meaningful distinctions in some things, and then in other areas, it's distinctions without, I would say, a difference. Um, and this can be in, in, in a variety of different areas. Uh, there are all, there are some real differences between quad and river houses. Uh, probably the one that often is of most concern to students is distance. Um, and uh, but there's also qualities to each house that I think students who are in each place would actually say that 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 makes each house a home for them. Um, I can say as the dean of the college that when we look at the survey data, every student falls in love with the house they're in. Now it's also, we also have though, recognizing that maybe, you know, sort of the sorting hat didn't quite work out for somebody or some people have changes. We actually have a very robust transfer process uh, for our students if they find after their first year that they didn't quite make the community that they were hoping for. Um, but, you know, uh, so there are students who transfer in both directions, by the way, um, and so we also try to create those opportunities. But I think, you know, in the spirit of what we were saying about a liberal arts and science education, that I think one of the things that we're really trying to help our students also understand is be open to serendipity, be open to possibility, be open, you know, that life is not a script that you can just check off, but rather actually it's that opportunity that that that's often, you know, uh, I think very few of us would want to go to, uh, you know, uh, uh, where we sort of defined our life at the end of it, saying, "Wow, I had a script and it, it just sort of <laughs> went that way." In fact, actually, it's those difficulties, it's those challenges, it's that adaptation that actually gives our life meaning, and that becomes a sort of narrative aspect of our life. Um, and so, um, you know, uh, I think all our houses are wonderful, and um, I think encouraging that optimism in our students whether it's majors and concentrations to the faculty they might have or the advisor, mm -hmm. to really learn how to sort of make the best of it and then adapt. Um, but also know that there's possibilities for change. If things are not working out after you give them a chance, we definitely want to make sure that each student ends up in a place that they're happy with um, and content with and find satisfaction in, in, in the community. So um, that's not the topic of liberal arts and sciences, but um, um, I do think it does speak to the fact that we think of our students' experience as holistic. That the, classroom experience and the experience in the houses to the experience in the co-curricular activities, we know our students have one Harvard experience and, and we want to acknowledge that and make sure these things are working consistently with each other. Um, I have a just last couple of questions that um, is, um, you know, what's your hope for our students um, after they leave Harvard? I hope that they will leave having learned some of the things that we have just been talking about for the last uh, half hour or so. Um, my hope, I suppose, is I'm feeling incredibly sort of uh, 
uh, you know, parental here. Uh, I hope they'll be happy, yeah. <laughs> you know. Um, but I hope that they'll be, I hope that they'll also be, uh, shall we say, good. You know, that is to say, I hope that they will be better listeners. You know, we again, we reward them for having achieved certain things, but I hope they will be, for, for, for being able to state certain goals and achieve them, I hope they will be better uh, listeners. I hope they will be um, better able to deal with the unexpected. I hope they will be better able to deal with difference. I hope they will be thoughtful, um, understand that things unfold. I seem to be returning to this theme yeah, it's often, beautiful. but it's important. It's a beautiful theme. You know, that they understand that things unfold over time. There isn't a quick answer. There isn't a quick solution yeah. to things. The different problems of different... <laughs> Search used to mean a different thing. It did. And searching meant different things than it does well, now. Well, and so I think to that point, I would say that, you know, things operate on different kinds of time scales. There's a search that has to do with, you know, finding the answer right now because mm. you have a deadline and you have to get this thing done. And then there's the search that has to do with how do you become a fulfilled person, but also how do you become a meaningful member of the community that you're in, which I hope are, I believe, genuinely, all our students are very conscious of that role that they should, you know, that they that they wish to inhabit in future. So, so how do they do those things? I, I want them to be better able to do that. I want them to know themselves better. I hope that they don't look back and see missed opportunities. Um, I feel that I go out into the world and I, I meet a lot of people who are, you know, late 40s, 50s, 60s who say, I, I went to Harvard, I really wish I had studied. Mm. I really wish I had done poetry. I really wish. Um, and, I, and if we drill down on why did you not, they often say, well, I felt like I had to do something practical. And so I just, I, I understand the value of the practical, but this is a rare opportunity these four years. An enormous amount of resources, intellectual as well as financial, have, have coalesced around this place to make available all possibilities to students. And so I hope students feel, looking back, that they made choices that were authentic mm. um, and not constrained. I, I, I just to one quick comment on that. I would say that you know I want them to have a wonderful time in college, but I don't want them to look back and say that was the best time in my life. Oh yeah, that's true. Right, <laughs> right. It shouldn't peak. <laughs> it shouldn't be the peak of your well, life. Well, it all. should be a moment where right. they were able to discover things that they could carry forward yeah. into a continually unfolding and fulfilling existence in a community. Yeah, that's, I, I really appreciate uh, everything that both of you have said and. And you know, if uh, when I think about it, and just kind of putting our conversation into sort of you know um, not a great synthesis, but there's sort of three things that sort of come to me for with the liberal arts and sciences. You know, one is to teach our students to engage critically with things, to mm -hmm. to to have perspective on them, to challenge them. Um, you know, all of your teachings, and you know, to not just take things for granted and and to understand where they came from. They haven't always been this way, not have the kind of presentist kind of view. Um, I think the second is, which is we hope that our students will be change, people who make changes in the world, right? And question authority, question received wisdom, challenge those types of things in ways that are productive and constructive. And, and I really also appreciate the last thing that, you know, which is that, you know, um, to develop something internally, um, a kind of interior life so that when the world pushes at you, you have something to kind of mm -hmm. push back uh, with so that you don't lose yourself, that self that you're sort of cultivating and knowing yourself in a way that, that is genuine, authentic. Um, and then I think that's the kind of person who's gonna be the most productive and often the most inspiring to others. Um, I think all of us, when we meet people who are authentic, who are vulnerable, who don't, you know, who realize that perfection is a second-rate idea, <laughs> We all get inspired by individuals like that. And I just want to say, uh, you know, one of the great gifts I think that we would all have is that I think one of the things that excites us about being at Harvard, and especially my faculty colleagues who go anywhere, and I'm sure they have, is that it's our students that keep us here. Um, our students, our colleagues, our community, and this commitment to being part of something that makes a positive difference in the world. Well, this has been such a great conversation. I want to just Thank you for both being here. Maya, thanks for coming back a second time uh, for this over the last few years. And Amanda, welcome to what will be many, I hope, of your opportunities to uh, uh, you know, communicate uh, about the vision that you're laying out and such an exciting vision for our undergraduate program. 
So um, I want to thank our wonderful audience out there, and I hope you found this helpful and meaningful. If we didn't get to all the questions, um, my fault, not theirs. So um, <laughs> thank you for uh, being a member of our Harvard community and our Harvard family. Thank you.